All right, maybe I will get us started. I know there will be a few uh, latecomers uh, who join us. We're just a couple minutes after the hour. So uh, I wanted to say good afternoon or good evening to uh, everyone who's joining us. My name is Justin Weir. Uh, I'm a professor in the Slavic department here at Harvard. Um, and I want to uh, welcome you on behalf of the Davis Center and the Slavic department to our uh, literature and culture seminar. This is our first talk of the year. Uh, and I would say we're starting off in spectacular form with our conversation today. Uh, it's my duty to remind you all of what has become very usual uh, Zoom talk practice. That is that you should turn off your microphones um, if you aren't the one speaking so that we don't have echoes that show up during the talk. Um, and when we get to the discussion uh, and question period, uh, use the raise hand feature um, that is on Zoom. And that way you'll be put into a queue where we'll know uh, that you have a question. So I'm delighted to see so many people. Uh, the way this will work is uh, I'm saying hello. I will briefly uh, turn things over to Kate Holland to welcome you on behalf of the Dostoevsky Society. And after that, uh, my colleague, William Mills Todd III, will introduce our terrific speaker, and he will serve uh, as our moderator for today. So thank you all for coming, and uh, I will leave things to Kate. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Kate Holland of the University of Toronto, and I'm the president of the North American Dostoevsky Society, which is pleased to be uh, co-hosting this lecture today. Um, this is one of um, four lectures which we're co-hosting, um, each of which will be held at a different university leading into 2021, uh, which is, of course, Dostoevsky's bicentennial year. So very, various events will also be taking place next year. Um, so there are there are three more talks. The next one is going to be um, Dr. Catherine Bowers of the University of British Columbia will be speaking at, at the University of Toronto on the 23rd of November. And then in the spring, we'll have two more talks. One um, it will be given by Dr. Barbara Henry of the University of Washington and Seattle, and she'll be speaking at UBC. And then uh, finally, Dr. Greta Matsnagor of the University of Southern California um, will be speaking at Bristol University. And of course, when I say at, um, all of this is happening on Zoom. So everybody is uh, invited and everybody's welcome. Um, also just wanted to say a couple of words about the North American Dostoevsky Society, which is a, a one of the uh, branches of the International Dostoevsky Society, an organization which um, has um, a, a long history. And um, um, we're about to kind of have a have a sort of another rebirth by having a new website, um, which um, will soon be unveiled, hopefully during um, Actually, the website don't don't go to the website quite yet because um, in in a couple of weeks it's going to be kind of there is going to be an unveiling which um, you'll hear about from various sources. Um, but I also wanted to encourage you um, in the next uh, in a little bit to join the society. So if you're in North America, um, it, we have the, we have the the NADS, the North American Dostoevsky Society, and if you're listening in from other places, you can join the International Dostoevsky Society. It's a very reasonable uh, membership. Um, we also have a new um, um, uh, journal. Well, we've we've had a journal for the last few years, but now it's going online, uh, which will be, which will be through the University of Verona, and the first issue should be out by the end of this year. Um, and of course, we we have regular in uh, conferences every three years. The last one was was in Boston uh, last summer, and the next one is going to be in Nagoya, Japan, in 2022. So keep an eye out for announcements about that. Um, and that's that's all from me for today. Thanks. I'll hand over to Bill, to Bill Todd, who's going to introduce uh, the speaker. Thank you very much, Kate. And uh, I am absolutely delighted to introduce Jonathan Payne to you. It's a pleasure I had hoped to have last March, but COVID intervened. And instead of doing this in person, we are now doing it on Zoom. And uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Penny Skolnick, who has done a 
a terrific job of choreographing this for us. Um, Jonathan uh, planned this talk initially as part of a book tour uh, for the uh, book that he had just published with the Harvard University Press at the end of last year. It's called Selling the Story, Transaction and Narrative Value in Balzac, Dostoevsky, and Zola. Uh, and I will say as a, as a personal note that I uh, first heard of Jonathan, uh, oh, in about uh, 2011 or so when I uh, was giving a talk at Oxford and he couldn't attend, but uh, his supervisors told me what a wonderful dissertation he was planning to write uh, and indeed eventually did write. But I met him uh, at the International Dostoevsky Conference in Moscow in 2013, which uh, was a wonderful event, but uh, a rather theologically oriented one. Uh, so Jonathan's uh, approach to Dostoevsky, reminding us that Dostoevsky was a uh, extraordinarily adept and sophisticated professional writer, uh, was a breath of fresh air. And indeed that talk was electrifying. Uh, one of the most, uh, what should we say, mind blowing talks I've heard at one of these conferences. Uh, Jonathan comes to us with a uh, BA from Oxford in, in French and Russian and a DPhil from Oxford. And he's now a supernumerary fellow of Wolfson College at Oxford. Now these would uh, all be in themselves enviable uh, accomplishments and uh, indeed they are, but uh, what for the, at least this Dostoevsky scholar is quite fascinating is what Jonathan did between uh, the BA and the DPhil, which was to work for some decades as, a, uh, in, as an investment banker, uh, ultimately as a senior advisor and managing director of Rothschild and, and Company. Uh, for Dostoevsky's readers, that Rothschild uh, sends off all sorts of uh, flares uh, as, an, as an image of the, uh, what should we say, decadent materialistic uh, West. So uh, Jonathan uh, brings to Dostoevsky scholar, scholarship a very different perspective. Uh, he uses these skills in several other ways. Uh, he is our genius treasurer of the International Dostoevsky Society, highly overqualified for the job. And he has been uh, for some years now a co-convener of a research group on economics and the arts, uh, which has had several gatherings at, at Oxford and at uh, Brandeis University. So uh, having filled you in on this, this uh, tremendously uh, varied and appropriate background. I will give the floor to Jonathan uh, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you, thank you, Bill. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kate, and thank you, Justin, as well. And I'm very sorry that I'm not able to do this uh, in the flesh. Um, everything now seems to be virtual. So uh, I think we, we can only hope that, um, that this works. As you can probably see, I'm trying to use a new feature of Zoom, which allows me to put my presentation behind my talking head. Um, I, I hope it's working. I can't, I can't really see from here whether you are experiencing what I am, but it's looking okay from my, not from my end. Anyway, um, let, let me start. And let me start um, maybe by asking you all a question. Have you ever thought what it means to write for money? Does it change what you write? And if so, how? How do you know what will sell and what won't? And how does trying to deliver what a reader or a publisher wants fit with what you want to write as an author? And perhaps most importantly, how can you detect these processes from the text itself? This is the essence of what I investigate 
in my book, which Bill has introduced to you and which is the subject of my talk today. It's also what I define as economic criticism. And part of what I'll be talking about will be to suggest new ways of looking at this rather poorly developed arm of literary criticism. So I'm planning to illustrate my proposition today with examples from Dostoevsky and from Balzac. Uh, more, I think, from Dostoevsky rather than Balzac, given the composition of the audience today. Um, I want to show that the thesis works across time and across geography. And the French and Russian literary markets are, I think, li linked in ways I'll return to, but this isn't just about Russia and France. My proposition is just as applicable to Dickens or Faulkner as it is to Balzac and Dostoevsky. That should have changed the slide, but hasn't. There we go. Let's start with three aspects of economic criticism and illustrate how combining them can create a genuinely new critical perspective. Put yourself for the moment in the shoes of a 19th century novelist. You have financial pressures, doesn't everyone? You need to get published, but depending on which literary market you live in, your next novel might get picked up as a serial by a daily newspaper in France, by Moody's in England as a triple decker three volume library book, or by a book sized monthly periodical in Russia. And it makes a difference because the demographics of the readership are quite different. You write journalism in between novels to keep the wolf from the door and learn new journalistic techniques of sensationalism, compression and immediacy. You write about what you encounter in your daily life, deals, transactions, negotiations. You worry about who your re real readers are and how to reach them. And just maybe you think about how fast the market is growing and what sort of readers will read your work if it lasts another 50 years. But how to establish this without simply fantasizing about what an author might have thought? In point of fact, a wealth of contemporary evidence exists without relying on speculation. Let me suggest three tools which form the basis of my approach to economic criticism. Together, they form what I call the point of sale perspective. In other words, how an author might have conceived of the value of his or her creation at the moment of writing. And the use of the word value in this context hovers deliberately somewhere between the aesthetic and the economic. The first is to establish, to understand the text as the object of a real economic transaction, a commodity which is bought and sold to try to isolate some of the external economic factors inherent in the publishing context. The second is to identify separately the role of economics and transaction in plot. It's obvious and at the same time surprising because we rarely talk about it in these terms, how frequently doing deals is the motor of novelistic plot. Think Dickens, think Balzac, think Faulkner. Finally, I want to consider narrative as a transaction with the reader. When you publish a novel, you ask the reader to exchange his or her time and perhaps money for your narrative. Whether you talk about it in these terms or not, what both sides are doing is establishing a kind of yardstick of literary value, an anticipated equivalence between a quantum of time or money and the reader's experience in consuming the text. And that value can be changed by a wide variety of literary devices, genre, plot, style, to appeal to differing audiences. So by close reading and paying particular attention to alterations in style and content relative to reader demographics, the, no the novel can reveal how its author perceived and manipulated the value of the text. And in this case, value clearly has both aesthetic and economic connotations. The novel becomes, in effect, a self-reflective commentary on the conditions of its own production. Let's have a closer look at each of these. 
you probably can't read the caption on the cartoon because I think my head is probably in front of it. Um, it comes from an 1845 edition of the English satirical magazine Punch, which shows a boy in a newspaper shop. Now, my man, what is it? asks the newspaper news vendor. I want an illustrated newspaper with a norrid murder and a likeness in it, replies the boy. The cartoon summarises succinctly her changes in format, in style, in content and in reach, fundamentally changed publishing markets across Europe during the course of the 19th century. But each market evolved differently. Readerships grew at different rates, depending on the speed of industrialization, the rate of urbanization, and ultimately the spread of literacy. As the mass market grew, so did the demand for new formats and new styles to cater to new culture and tastes, as the Punch cartoon illustrates. Sensational reporting, pictures, and the cheap accessible format sold newspapers by the millions. But Different markets developed different formats or developed similar formats, but at different rates. And authors in some markets found themselves uneasily aware of growing dislocations between imported formats and the tastes of the readership. Publishing was also becoming profitable, although again at different speeds. And the rate of investment in the industry is also a major determinant of how fast a particular market grew and what formats evolved. Let me illustrate this through a quick comparison of three publishing markets which developed at vastly different speeds during the 19th century and where the speed of development becomes a significant influence on authors and their output. In England, rapid industrialization and the concurrent development of a literate urban mass readership meant that the publishing market grew early and fast. I've illustrated the cover of a rather unassuming pamphlet entitled The Particular Account of the Murder of Mr. Thomas Weir, and the Trial of John Thurtnell and Joseph Hunt, and the Execution of John Thurtnell. What is, uh, this is published by James Catnack in 1823. What is extraordinary about this is that it sold 250,000 copies in one week and his account of the trial proper ran to half a million copies. No other publishing market in the world was able to support a market of this size at this date. As a direct result of the profitability of the publishing business, the market was able to support a multitude of different publishing formats right throughout the century, from proto-tabloid newspapers to the three volume book format, which became the standard for serious fiction. This is one of the distinguishing features of the 19th century English publishing market and is a clear influence on the variety and reach of English prose fiction over the century. By contrast, the French publishing market couldn't hope to support this profusion. Later industrialization, slower urbanization and slower penetration of literacy meant that a mass readership wouldn't develop until after the middle of the century. In this environment, newspapers had the upper hand economically simply because they were offer, able to offer a variety of content to a broader readership within a single format. They also quickly discovered that prose fiction was a powerful sales driver and found a home for daily episodes of serialized novels at the foot of the first page of their four page format. Eugène Sue's Les Mystères de Paris, which you'll know as an interminable story about a reformed prostitute and a prince in disguise set in the Parisian criminal underworld and serialized over the best part of two years from June 1842 to October 1843, which propelled the rather stuffy paper which published it from 4,000 to 40,000 subscribers. Books, of course, continued to be published, mostly in print, print runs of 1,000 to 5,000, but more as a kind of product extension to the shop window of the newspaper. Right up to the 1870s, even the leading book pub publishers continued to lose money. And then, all of a sudden, the situation changed. The sixth novel in Zola's Chronicle of the Rougon Macau family, Les Samoirs, published in 1877, sold 75,000 copies on its own. Nana, in 1880, had a first day print run 
of 55,000, and even so, his publisher had to order more by evening. Zola's particular brand of sensation and shock may have been the immediate catalyst, but behind the scenes, a real mass readership had developed and publishing costs had tumbled. So the bestseller had come of age. The book format had been re-established as a separate economic entity, and Zola would become the novelist of the new phenomenon of his age, the rise of big business. But for those seeking to understand the effect of the publishing context in France, this almost 50 year period in the middle of the 19th century when the book format had become economically subservient to the newspaper is profoundly important. Professional authors had to become journalists to survive. In doing so, they became part of their publisher's sales strategy. But just as they were forced to live in this economic context, so their works had to adapt to the context of the newspaper, to coexist alongside other genres, and to understand how, how those genres also played a role in the survival of the newspaper. So not just literature, but the very building blocks of writing, genre, plot, literary device, acquire economic as well as aesthetic functions. The form of literature, appearing daily in serialized episodes, became a device for retaining subscribers. Narrative had become an economic commodity. In Russia, the publishing market was even further behind. Even at, even at the end of the century, overall literacy had re only reached just over 20% compared to over 90% in France. Local conditions led to idi idiosyncratic publishing formats, the most obvious of which was the emergence in the mid 1830s of what became known as the thick journals. For the non-students of Russian literature, this was a kind of journal in book format consisting of some 500 or so pages of essays, travelogues, opinion pieces, reviews, and entire books of prose fiction designed to survive the mud and rain which made travel in provincial Ru Russia virtually impossible for six months of every year. But even by 1880, the total circulation of all Russian thick journals amounted to no more than around 40,000 copies. And this would have been the main vehicle for a writer like Dostoevsky to reach his readers. But despite the economic lag, the Russian publishing market seems to have been fixated by what was going on in Western Europe, particularly in France, to the extent that publishing strategies developed abroad were adopted lock, stock and barrel without developing a comparable readership. Boulevard newspapers appeared in Russia in 1864, just one year after their equivalent in France. But whereas the French version, Le Petit Journal, started life with a circulation of 83,000 and rose within two years to a quarter of a million. The Russian equivalent, the Taborsky stock, took three years to reach 1,000 subscribers and another 13 years to add a second thousand. In these circumstances, it must have been difficult for Russian authors to know who they were writing for, the small actual readership which paid the bills, or the ephemeral but visible mass readership around the corner, which might deliver a quite different form of literary worth in the shape of posterity value. I think this has a profound influence on some, possibly all of the major Russian writers of the 19th century. In particular, it may explain why gambling speculation is such an important trope of the period, not just a reflection of contemporary society, but an emblem of the writer's own relationship with an unpredictable readership. Unsurprisingly, transactions are an astonishingly productive source of plot material. This is particularly so in the 19th century when transacting became part of everyday life across entire societies. Perhaps we should mine this resource more systematically. Transactions between in-story characters signpost how an author sees the process of negotiation and the establishment of equivalences between different commodities, and in doing so provides a commentary on the author's own relationship with his economic environment. More importantly, they also signal how the author approaches the all-important transaction with the reader. Authors discuss and represent context, concepts of narrative value within their texts all the time. 
on occasion they write directly about the value of literary or artistic production, as Gogol does in Portrait or Balzac does in Illusion Perdue. More often, they describe in-story characters telling and receiving stories and share the mechanisms that determine credibility from the point of view of a story's narrator and of its in-story recipient. Entire genres, detective stories, crime novels, courtroom dramas depend on concepts of narrative value. Think of Sherlock Holmes's unerring ability to, us to assess the value of stories he's told, usually contrasted to Dr. Watts Watson's equally infallible tendency to get it wrong. The external reader is required to become involved as critic of these mimetic narratives, attributing more value, for example, to the narrative of one character than another, modifying the perception of value as new narratives are presented, and understanding, even if intuitively rather than explicitly, what it is that's caused value to shift. Assessing the value of a literary narrative, even if we don't express it in those terms, is something that we all do routinely. Let me show you what I mean by contrasting examples from a couple of early works of Balzac and Dostoevsky. In the early years of the 1830s, Balzac wrote a novella which he originally called La Transaction, The Deal. It tells the story uh, of a Napoleon, Napoleonic hero who's wounded and left for dead in the retreat from Moscow in 1812. <clears throat> when he finally makes, him, makes his way back to France five years later, he finds that he has been officially declared dead, that his estate has been divided up, and his wife has remarried. He is faced with the task of proving his identity to claim his rights, with only his story to go on. So this is a narrative about the value of narrative. Without proof of his identity, the colonel's worth is literally dependent on the credibility of his story. The plot makes the reader aware of how, how narratives can behave just like securities on a stock exchange. Stories may have a face value quite different from their market worth. Narrative values can go down as well as up. His lawyer even tracks the price of the story in terms of the likely financial value of his to-be-recovered estate. This is a reflection on what constitutes narrative credibility. Balzac enacts the question through his characters, but simultaneously he forces his story. He ultimately fails, but in doing so, highlights how Balzac, as author, is in the same game. He rides the contemporary vogue for short stories. Newspapers were first beginning to wake up to the impact which prose fiction could have on subscription sales. Specific literary genres and devices, melodrama, voyeurism, the power of a name, just the devices Balzac uses in the story, were demonstrably popular and successful. Balzac uses his own storytelling pr prowess to establish his own credibility as a writer. Just as importantly, it helped pay the bills. Credit is simply the economic expression of credibility. Compare this to how Dostoevsky begins his writing career barely, barely 10 years later. In the intervening 10, 10 years, newspaper prices in France had halved and the circulation of the Parisian press had more than doubled. The novel published in daily serial episodes had established itself as one of the key drivers of news, newspaper subscriptions. Les Mystères de Paris had transformed the finances of the journal which published it by its mixture of wireism, crime and money. Russia had taken notice. Les Mystères de Paris was published in Russian in 1844, less than 12 months after serialization in France had finished. Dostoevsky himself had trans, uh, <coughs> uh, translated Eugénie Grande into Russian in 1843. Awareness of change had reached the Russian market, but the change itself would take another three decades at least. So it's perhaps not surprising that Dostoevsky's first novel, Poor People, 
focuses our attention on the acts of writing and reception. It tells the story of a relationship between a copy clerk and his Grisette cousin Varvara, trying to get on by on a get by on a shoestring in St. Petersburg. Its format, an exchange of letters, seems at first outdated until you realize that it echoes in miniature the serials which had become so successful in France. It seems to ask who the readers of the text really are and how they read. This may be a novel about poor people, but it is not a novel for poor people. Neither the, re of the readers of the novel's letters could have afforded to buy the journal which published it. Its contemporary target readership would have been a relatively tiny audience of the wealthy and educated in Moscow and St. Petersburg. It's also a novel of misreadings. Djavushkin, the copy clerk, is in love with his cousin and expects her momentarily to realize that she reciprocates his affection. Varvara str successfully strings him along while unsuccessfully trying to fend off a rich but predatory businessman. Neither communicates on the other's wavelengths and we as readers voyeuristically follow the slow motion car crash. Reader response as depicted in the story is impossible to predict and usually misguided. Even the act of copying fails to produce predictable results. A mistake earns Djavushkin a reward rather than a punishment. He comments with amazed incomprehension on correlations between genre and success in the publishing world. Poor people, he implies, don't react in the same way. And on the horizon lurks a threat. If a mass readership is, is ever to be achieved, it will need to include the boorish businessman who makes off with his varianta, a man who hates books, thinks they give young girls ideas and doesn't read fiction himself. This is the potential reader who Dostoevsky needed to attract if the mounting gambling debts were to be paid. The novel moves beyond the story of a relationship into the realm of a commentary on the Russian readership and its publishing market. The narrative becomes a discussion of the conditions of its own production. In doing so, Dostoevsky opens the first chapter of what was to become a lifelong obsession. So, if the story can become both the object of a genuine transaction between author and reader and a discussion of that transaction, then we can also analyze it in terms of different models of transaction types. If you want to buy something, how do you discover its value? One way is for the seller to tell you. You can then decide whether to buy or not. I call this the prospectus approach. The seller advertises a good for sale at a price that he or she fixes. Most 19th century novels were in fact sold by prospectus. The illustration shows one for Balzac's La Comédie Humaine. Another way is for the seller to ask buyers to bid. This is the auction approach in which value is fixed by competition between buyers. A final way, and other than gift, there are only three ways, is for buyer and seller to roll the dice, the speculative approach. Narrative, I suggest, behaves in a similar way. Identifying which transaction mode the author is using can tell us a lot about the authorial perspective at the point of sale. Let me illustrate this by reference to Dostoevsky. I've just suggested that all his writings betray an obsession with narrative recession, reception, both within the text and between text and reader. His re-engagement with the literary world of the early 1860s after his return from exile placed him in a situation in which almost all public texts became part of a wider polemic. The great reforms imposed new commercial, legislative and judicial structures on a country which required change but had little experience of how to handle it. The press, trying to modernize, copied the mass market techniques of its English and French counterparts without having developed a mass market to address. Professional writers were forced to engage with the intellectual debate, yet at the same time needed to attract and retain subscribers for the periodicals in which they were published. Successful prose fiction demanded novelty to attract, yet to attract readers, yet had to be a predictable source of value for publishers. 
Dostoevsky's literary output reveals an unresolved tension between the economic need to tell a racy story that combined the staple commercial drivers of sex, money, and crime with a philosophical debate about morality and nationhood. Nowhere is this more clearly seen than in his own mono journal, Diary of a Writer, which he wrote and published in the later 1870s, and which tells us that, a, that the mixture of intellectual debate, nationalism, and prurient reportage of sensational happenings was even, evidently a successful com commercial strategy within a journalistic format. Whether it would work as well in the extended format of a novel was less clear. Dostoevsky's final novel, The Brothers Karamazov, is, I suggest, his way of finding out. This is a novel about how to write a novel. I want to take you step by step through how Dostoevsky offers its text to us as readers and the conclusion, which, conclusions which I draw from this analysis. So please excuse a rather extended example. Over the course of the entire book, 16 episodes serialized monthly with gaps over almost two years from January 1879 to November 1880, Dostoevsky explores reader reception to an extraordinary range of genres and literary devices. Karamazov is Dostoevsky's most carefully orchestrated example of this technique of multiple sequential narrative bets. The very title of brothers, plural, suggests multiple perspectives around a family focus. Its plot is, in its barest essentials, a courtroom drama, a genre that depends on the competitive retelling of narratives. The accused's fate hangs not on facts, but on narrative credibility. The issue of who has the better story is fundamental to both Dmitri's conviction and to the opposition between Ivan's Grand Inquisitor and Alyosha's Russian monk. From the opening pages of the preface, Dostoevsky declares himself aware of the danger that the reader will simply put the book down. It matters how the story is told. The first half of the book, six books uh, of the work, six books, eight months worth of serialization, explores narrative as prospectus. A prospectus narrative is the assertion of narrative value, for example, a religious text, philosophy, any kind of didactic work. It's symbolized in Karamazov by the world of the church elders, whose word is law. Bakhtin calls it the authoritative word and even returns, re refers to it in this precise context as the word of our fathers. Dostoevsky proposes to his reader a series of scenarios in which he illustrates how different characters attempt to assert and receive prospectus narratives. The context itself of a plot which revolves around Dmitri's contested inheritance suggests a causal link between narrative skill, how well Dmitri puts his case, and economic value, the amount of his inheritance. Dostoevsky's starting point is to establish whether any form of asserted value is compatible with the novelistic format. He chooses a series of genres traditionally associated with the transmission of a message from author to recipient. So confession in the shape of Dmitri's confession to Alyosha, melodrama, which depends on predictable audience reactions in the shape of various anecdotes of hysteria and excess, Father Ferropont's devils, Ilusha biting Alyosha's finger, parable, which carries a narratorial message in the shape of the legend of the Grand Inquisitor, and hagiography, which assumes shared belief with the reader in the shape of Alyosha's biography of the elder Zosima. To make the point even clearer, Dostoevsky even contrasts genres in his chapter titles, following, for example, a confession in verse with a confession in anecdotes. And right in the middle of his experiment, Dostoevsky sows a seed of doubt. The unruly Karamazov uh, father, Fyodor Pavlovich, is just as much an agent of narrative disruption as he is of social confusion. He tells graphic stories from Boulevard newspapers. He challenges all accepted beliefs. He suggests narrative can and does 
lie. Sure enough, all of Dostoevsky's prospectus narratives are shown to be flawed in their attempt to find a seamless way to incorporate moral, philosophical, or ethical debate into fiction. Dimitri's confession in verse degenerates into a garbled, into garbled plagiarism and is replaced by the vivid prose of his anecdotes, earthy, fast-moving, compelling as fiction, but devoid of the philosophical weight of, ver of verse. Melodrama also works as fiction, but raises the question of whether intellectualization and rationality are compatible at all with a genre of excess. The par parable of the Grand Inquisitor tries to address this by taking three key components of melodrama, fantasy, suspense, and authorial control, and dressing them up as the building blocks of faith, miracle, mystery, and authority. In equating the two, Dostoevsky casts doubt on each. Can a faith based on the Grand Inquisitor's methods command belief? Can a narrative based on these literary devices command credibility? And finally, Alyosha tries his own hand at writing Zosima's life and discovers that writing credible fiction is a lot more difficult than he had assumed. His attempt degenerates into a mere repetition of Zosima's teaching, standard part of hagiography, less so of a novel. Is this a failure of the message or a failure of the medium? The question may be left in the air, but the book ends with Zosima's death and the report swirling around the town that his body has started to stink. What remains is the tabloid image of his decomposing corpse, sensational, headline-grabbing, commercial. It becomes the emblem of the failure of prospectus narrative. So, I suggest Dostoevsky turns to the next form of transaction type, what I call the auction narrative. If an author no longer trusts the techniques of prospectus narrative, then the solution is to look to the recipients of that narrative. In the commercial world, this is, of course, exactly what does happen. Authors usually there offer their manuscripts to publishers who value them based on anticipated reader reaction. Just as in a real auction, the process prompts the potential buyer to ask questions about why one text is more or less valuable than others and how other possible buyers will value it. If you think about the salient characteristics of auctions, two things stand out. First, the use of iteration as bid succeeds bid and object succeeds object as a means of reaching the widest possible universe of buyers. Second, the use of money as a common currency against which to value different objects. Measuring against these criteria allows us to see just how much Dostoevsky's narrative borrows from the techniques of the auction. After a pause, the narrative plunges straight into the story of the murder of Fyodor Pavlovich, the aggressor of Dmitri and his subsequent trial. The focus barely varies for five books or an entire year's worth of serialization. The central genre is that of the courtroom drama, with its hidden trunk of what really happened, surrounded by a forest of alternatives. Fyodor Pavlovich is murdered. The subsequent investigation and trial provide an opportunity for accused, witnesses, police, and lawyers to recount the same story. In fact, if you count them up, Dostoevsky retells the story of the murder 38 separate times in whole and part. The te technique is as commercial as it is experimental. It allows Dostoevsky to repeat the juicy tabloid details of the murder, which clearly sold newspapers to readers of the Fait d'Hiver. At the same time, it confronts the reader with serious questions about how narrative value is created and modulated. Dostoevsky repeatedly shifts between genres and makes sure that his readers are aware of the process. The narrator's initial account of the murder is presented as realistic, but in fact, bears all the hallmarks of melodrama. The wealth of detail masks the omission of crucial facts, a device borrowed from the emerging genre of the detective novel, which helps the novelist to maintain suspense. Subsequent re-narrations 
oscillate from the poetry of Dmitri's prayer for forgiveness on the way to meet Grushenka to the natural, naturalistic detail of the police investigation. There are frequent references by characters to literary genres to make sure the reader remains alert. At one point, Dostoevsky even rewrites the murder as a newspaper article for a Petersburg gossip sheet and illustrates in the character of Madame Khaklokova who the target reader might be. Dmitri's trial is represented by both prosecutor and defense counsel as a contest between two novels. It's the perfect genre to allow the author to maximize the commercial potential of the novel. But iteration also reveals, I think, how uncertain Dostoevsky must have been about his own ability to prescribe narrative value in the context of a relatively tiny current readership. Dostoevsky uses the theme of money to illustrate this. As many critics have noticed, the theme is central to the plot, just as the notion of money as common currency against which, other, against which other things are valued is central to the concept of an auction. One particular amount, the figure of 3,000 rubles, reverberates throughout the novel. The choice of an iterated fixed value makes us wonder what it might suggest. Closer examination reveals that far from implying any broader system of reliable valuations, it's an authorial code for speculative or ephemeral value. Dmitri never collects his 3,000 ruble inheritance, nor does he send the promised 3,000 rubles to Katharina Ivanovna's sister, nor does he spend the full 3,000 rubles on the party with Kurushinka, nor does he succeed in borrowing it from any of his potential lenders. Fyodor Pavlovich never succeeds in acquiring Kurushenka for the 3,000 rubles he sealed in an envelope, and the same 3,000 rubles stolen by Smedyakov is never verified. And finally, Fetukovich's defense of Dmitri for a 3,000 ruble fee fails. If fixed values are inherently misleading, then does it follow that narratives with similar characteristics are also likely to fail to hold their value with readers? The Grand Inquisitor's proposition of a world governed by his fixed values is rejected by the in-story reader and recipient of Ivan's narrative, Alyosha. Dostoevsky seems to be asking simultaneously whether his narrative of the Grand Inquisitor even if told via, via an in-story character, would be accepted by readers as a legitimate part of a work of fiction. It successfully integrated short fictional stories into the journalistic context, con con context of Diary of a Writer. Brothers Karamazov inverts the question, does philosophical polemic have a place in a work of fiction? And perhaps most importantly, whether any work of fiction which did not contain this element could hope to attain perpetuity value as part of the literary canon. How can an author stay in control of the value of his text? Is this possible at all? Karamazov is full of images of in-story characters losing control of their own narratives while the author stays in control of his. Fyodor Pavlovich starts the novel by losing control at the monastery, Dmitri loses control in his dream of the starving ch uh, child, the Dicho. Ivan loses control in his encounter with the devil. Alyosha loses control over his emotions in Cana of Galilee and, I think, over his narrative in the biography of Zosima. Smerdyakov even fakes loss of control in his pretend epileptic fit to show how he, as the author of a significant twist in the plot, can remain in charge while depicting dysfunction. Once again, Dostoevsky uses his own plot to experiment with the answer. Iteration, it turns out, is not just an experimental technique, but more importantly, is part of the answer. To sell his work, the artist can't afford to ignore literary devices which create predictable commercial value, but overuse risks cliche, the point at which repeated iteration frustrates the effect of the device and destroys narrative value. At the other extreme lies memory, another variant in which narrative acquires a perpetual value as long as iteration in memory lasts. 
the two extremes, like Christ and the Grand Inquisitor, are at times a hair's breadth apart. Dostoevsky seems to push his narrative experimentally over the cliff of control to see what happens, just as he pushes his characters over their personal brinks. The stories of the Snigilyov family, Ilyusha's death, and the gang of boys led by Kolya teeter on the edge of bathos and sentimental cliche. Yet the fact that we're still discussing them today indicates that at some point, iteration has created a perpetuity value out of or possibly despite the cliche. The point is best illustrated perhaps by the very final scene in the novel, Alyosha's speech of the stone, which closes the epilogue. Its subject is memory a memorial for Ilyusha and the, shared, and the celebration of the shared memories of the 12 boys who've become Alyosha's symbolic disciples. Robin Farr Miller has pointed out how its many echoes of earlier scene refresh the reader's memories of the entire narrative and show the power of this shared dialogue to create its own perpetuity value through common memories. And it clearly marks Dostoevsky's claim to perpetuity value both for the Christian ideals which it promotes and by extension for the entire novel as a literary achievement. But this final um, uh, image is profoundly ambiguous. I think we experience it in two dimensions, simultaneously aware of the attraction of its spiritual scope and of a rejection of its emotional overload. We're aware of the, of the narrative skill and commercial power which have kept us reading for some 700 pages or almost two years of serialization. But there's something unresolved in this resolution, a sense that the desired, desired equilibrium is not to be had, that narrative has indeed become speculative. The fact that this dialogue continues right up to the closing pages of Kredomazov is an indication that for Dostoevsky, no definitive answer exists, like roulette, completion delivers only random outcomes. The fact that Dostoevsky does not resolve the balance between fictional credibility and the capacity of fiction to sustain a serious moral message may be an indication that for him, there is no sustainable point of balance. Finally, Dostoevsky's famous unfinalizability is itself a successful commercial strategy based on iteration. In attempt to, in attempting to write for an undeveloped but predicted mass audience, as well as for a more limited contemporary audience, in trying to combine intellectual weight with compulsive narrative, in seeking ways to assert dearly held beliefs without alienating readers or inadvertently traducing his own case, the strategy of avoiding definition is perfectly logical. The value of his own memory, the perpetuity value of his own text depends in part on this ability to touch multiple audiences through multiple media, whilst trying to maximize the likelihood of a good reception. Dostoevsky and Fiasco, writes John Jones, are never far apart. Playing the odds reduces the damage of any single fiasco and recognizes that the constraints of writing within a fictional genre make it impossible to fix values, even for a single reader. From the all-in strategy of the hero of the gambler, playing his last coin on the tables in Roulettenberg, Dostoevsky has shifted to a more cautious tactic of multiple bets. His narrative plays are more deliberate, accepting fiasco as one losing bet among other winning ones. If Roulettenberg is where Dostoevsky learnt to gamble, then the brothers Karamazov is where he finally masters the art of placing the bet. I began this talk by a plea for greater recognition for the relevance of economic criticism. I hope I've managed to show you how it can produce a quite distinct critical perspective. Our modern world provides us with countless everyday examples of the importance of narrative, the power of the story to handle everything uh, from advertising to business, to politics and to literature. Over the past two centuries, selling the story has evolved from a cottage industry into arguably the biggest business in the world. Understanding and manipulating narrative is fundamental to countless professions and is overwhelmingly the most powerful argument for the importance of the humanities 
as a university discipline. This is not an attempt to impose economics on literature. It is simply a demonstration of how narrative is inseparable from the creation of economic value. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for this um, absolutely wonderful uh, multi-dimensional talk, uh, beautifully or elegantly organized, I would say, uh, using elegance in a kind of mathematical uh, sense. You, uh, in your introduction to the talk uh, with its focus on, on point of sale, um, talked about wanting to deal with several dimensions of the literary process. Uh, the text as a product uh, proposed, the plot of the text, uh, the text's relationship with the, with the readers. And I think, uh, especially with your reading of the brothers Karamazov, who've uh, done this with wonderful success. And while the focus is uh, rigorously economic throughout, uh, as you well point out, value is not just an economic term, but an aesthetic term and uh, a moral issue as, as well. There were many points in your talk where all of these, these came together. Uh, and we will now have a, a question and answer, uh, but I would, I would like to sort of address a moment um, in your talk, which uh, really brought what you're doing to life for me. And this involves book six of the novel, The Russian Monk. Uh, the prospectus narrative, as you term it, uh, which uh, Alyosha himself sits down to write uh, as a saint's life, a hagiography of his mentor, uh, Zosima. Now, uh, there are a number of people in the audience who've read, I'm sure, Dostoevsky's correspondence about the novel, uh, the various uh, prospectuses which he sent to his publisher, Katkov, his editor, Yubimov, um, and to the high official, Bedenostov, uh, and that insecurity that you talk about, he was uh, very much manifested uh, in his writing about book six, which was supposed to be the counterpart to Ivan's rebellion against the Trinity in, in book five. Um, and you present this as a failure, uh, book six. You point out that it uh, concludes with the eruption of the uh, sensational, uh, namely the decomposition of uh, Zosima's body, which seems to many of the townsfolk uh, and perhaps many readers of the novel, a kind of, uh, what should we say, a failure to uh, accept Alyosha's prospectus. And I wanted to uh, throw out uh, throw this out to you as an instance and ask you to comment on the ways in which it has had uh, perpetuity value. And this was um, some years after Dostoevsky's death, uh, Tolstoy, uh, who was not Dostoevsky's greatest admirer, uh, sought to publish this book six in his uh, publication for the peasantry. Uh, the uh, imperial censorship would not allow him do, to do that. But to me, this is an example of how something which, uh, something can be a failure in, in your terms within the narrative. It can be an example of a failed uh, prospectus. And yet uh, on that speculative dimension, can have a measure of success. And I wonder uh, in terms of your um, sort of tripartite argument about different transactions, uh, 
how you would think about Tolstoy's uh, response some years later to that section of the novel. Um, thank you, Bill. That's, um, that's an, interesting, an interesting question. I think it goes back um, to the distinction that I made between the medium and the message. Um, we're, we are shown, I think, um, Alyosha getting the medium wrong. That doesn't necessarily mean that the message uh, is wrong. And I'm sure that um, you know, Dostoevsky's other correspondence, I think, sh shows clearly that he, he would have uh, preferred to have been able to promote the Christian message, um, or his own variant of the Christian message, possibly, um, uh, uh, as, as hard as he could. And, uh, and that was one of his objectives in, in writing. So I think he, in, in a funny sort of way, um, this achieves the objective precisely in that um, you know, he's created a narrative which people, where people can, um, which reaches different parts of the audience differently. In other words, Tolstoy sees in it something which relates to the message um, and probably overlooks the fact that, uh, that, that there is something um, amiss with the medium uh, and picks it out and wants to distribute it and pr to promote it of, based on the message. You and I, I think, saw this clearly when we were in Moscow together and on the, uh, uh, the, the 2013 Dostoevsky conference, which, as you said in your introduction, was slightly theological um, in, in tone. Uh, and um, uh, you know, again, I think a, a, a part of, the, um, of Dostoevsky's readership had picked a particular message which reverberated with them irrespective of the fact that I, I, I think um, what they are, uh, what they're, they're picking out is not necessarily wholly supported by other aspects of the text. And I think this is, um, this is one of Dostoevsky's tricks, in fact, that you know, he, he is able um, through cleverly using iteration and retelling um, to appeal to all sorts of different um, people who certainly don't agree with each other um, and, and probably never, ne never will, but nonetheless mean that his reach is extraordinary for a writer writing something which lies uneasily between a, detect a, 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 a sort of courtroom drama um, and a, uh, a philosophical examination. Yes, good. Thank you very much. I'm beginning to get some uh, sort of requests for uh, questions. And I see that Justin Weir uh, has a question. Uh, Justin? Uh, well, I believe Robin has a question. I do have a question, but why don't, okay. uh, why I, see don't I let Robin, Robin go um, uh, first here? I'm happy to wait, Justin. <laughs> well, I would just, I mean, I'll, I'll say uh, that I love the talk um, and uh, I'm not someone who knows a lot about economic criticism of, uh, of Dostoevsky, but I, I found myself most interested uh, in the kind of transaction that you excluded uh, quickly, which is the gift. Uh, and I was reminded of so many, uh, what would you call them, ill-defined transactions in Dostoevsky, in Dostoevsky where you get more than you bargained for. Um, you know, whether it's Raskolnikov in the bar overhearing some second-rate utilitarian philosophy or um, I was reminded of the times when I'm, uh, I pay for a meal and they bring me some sort of mint or chocolate at the end and whether I want it or not, I eat it. Uh, and... Similarly, in our in our large journals, uh, of course, you know you're you're getting some of these stories, whether that's why you wanted the journal or not. And so I guess uh, that was part of my question was to 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 ask about that boundary between um, the transactions, the prospectus auction, and speculative transactions, and and the uh, uh, the the gift that is somehow. Um, you know, gated and, and set aside? And when are the, do those boundaries bleed over in interesting ways? Um, yes, and you, you're quite right. Uh, it, this is one of the areas that I, I have not ventured onto largely because I think it opens um, quite a, a large area of potential discussion. Um, 
I think you have to start from the analytical point of, of whether um, the concept of, of, of gift really exists at all. And if you go back into the sort of classics, the Michael Mousig uh, examination of, uh, of gift, I think you you, you see the, um, the I, I think, a, a, a underlying scepticism that any form of gift exists which does not imply some form of expectation of return. Um, and I certainly think that's uh, an issue which Dostoevsky uh, touches on, perhaps less um, in Karamazov than he, than he does in The Idiot. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I think it comes into Karamazov through the character of Zosima. Um, and of course, through the relation of the role of the church elders, right at the beginning of the of the book, where uh, I, I think there's a an undercurrent um, that suggests that none of this is uh, is pure gift without expectation of return. Dostoevsky makes the point quite clearly that um, the the church elders are contributing freely to society in the expectation of uh, privilege of a, a, a privileged a privileged position in terms of being able to lay down religious law and religious practice and morality in other words there is there is some some kind of exchange um, going on and you you see this quite clearly in some of the early characters uh, chapters of the book where Dostoevsky contrasts the reception uh, of of two different um, uh, two different types of, of supplicant to Zosima. Um, the first group are simple peasants who accept the word of Zosima unquestioningly. The second is of Madame Khaklakova, who um, is much more contingent in her expectation of return and expects something back in return for her. For, for her commitment, um, and the, the juxtaposition of those characters, of those two chapters, uh, points to point, points to the question I think that you're raising. In other words, does gift exist as a pure, unrequited uh, tra transaction with no expectation of return? I'm not sure we ever get an answer from from that, but it but it, it is an undercurrent there. That doesn't answer your question, I know. But <laughs> thank, thank you very much. I have uh, two people in the queue, uh, Robin and then uh, Yuri Corrigan. Robin? So, Jonathan, thank you so much for this talk. And as you know, I am a tremendous fan of your work. And it has gotten us all thinking and talking in new ways. And I don't know how many times now I've repeated what your discovery about the murder being iterated 38 times over. I mean, it's, it's it, extraordinary. I have a question, but I do just quickly want to follow up on Justin's question about gift economies as well. And I take your remarks very, I mean, you're right. There is often an expectation of something, but I wonder about the gift that um, Jesus gives in the Cana of Galilee miracle where he changes the wine into water because there he's among people who already believe in him and it's a gratuitous gift. They don't need it. They're happy already. Uh, and I wonder if maybe that kind of gift doesn't occur in the human world of the Brothers Karamazov, but I wonder if that notion is somehow out there. My question was a little bit different. Um, I, I was thinking about your remarks on narrative and economic speculation. And I wonder if in this novel, um, Dostoevsky manages to have them, this kind of narrative and economic speculation, which you delineated for us, that it, if it kind of leaches into a sort of metaphysical speculation. And what I'm thinking of in particular, a, a metaphysical speculation about the infinity and enormity of human potential. And what I'm thinking about as a specific example of that is one that um, 
was pointed out, I think, first by my and, and uh, Bill's great teacher, Robert Belknap, in his first book, where he takes that moment when Dimitri is telling Alyosha what he might have done with Katerina Ivanovna. And he puts out several different scenarios which fan out into categories that you discuss in the course of your book. But he tells them to these different things that he might have done, ending with what he actually did do. But as the reader recedes into time and into his own reading, as, as Belknap points out, all of these potentials kind of coexist simultaneously, almost in like a fractalic model that gets replicated out then, whoops, sorry about this, um, through, through the novel. So I just um, wondered what you make about the different categories leaching into each other. Sorry, I can't seem to get my phone off. <laughs> there. <laughs> I think it's off. Um, I, I think, um, it, it, in a sense, the, uh, the, where that, where this meets my analysis um, it, is that these exist um, both as uh, a, a sort of metaphysical speculation, as you suggest, but also as contrasting narratives. And I think what what is happening here, whether and I, I wouldn't speculate whether this is deliberate or not. But at the same time as you, the reader is being asked um, the metaphysical questions, in other words, which, uh, which, which of these um, does he or she prefer, you're also being asked a question about narrative credibility. In other words, which of these fits better with your concept of Dimitri as a character. Um, so, the, the, and I think Dostoevsky is, is pretty much always do, doing this and saying, look, what do you believe in terms of um, a, uh, a, a, a building credibility in terms of text? Um, which of these fits best with the character that I am putting in front of you? Uh, as author, and then how does that contrast or conflict with your assumptions on the metaphysical level? Um, in other words, is it possible for to, to have a credible a, 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 a character called Dimitri that you actually believe in uh, if you don't at the same time um, believe he believe that he has taken the metaphysical choices which fit that character. In other words, is there a dissonance between um, the, uh, the between his moral choices and his credibility as a, um, a as a character in a novel? And just to eliminate to, to elaborate a bit further. I mean, the, the, the contrast between the confession in verse and the con confession in anecdotes, um, it clearly establishes that, just, that Dimitri is a character who exists in anecdotes. Um, he is, I think, much more credible as a, as, a, as a convincing, rounded person um, when he's in his sort of earthy mode rather than when he's quoting, misquoting Schiller. Um, and that, I think, is designed to tell us something about his moral choices as well, and we need to, um, and, and by what we believe in other aspects of him, we're also, I think, guided to um, the, the guided to what is right uh, for him in a moral uh, in, in a moral in a moral dimension, um, and are made simultaneously to, to contrast that with our own moral choices in relation to the same dilemma. In other words, we might not make the same choices. Confused. Okay, thank you. Um, Yuri? Hi, Jonathan, good to see you. I always yeah, Yuri, hi. Love, love to hear you speak and you know, I love your argument and it, I think it explains things to me that I always felt about Dostoevsky but didn't 
didn't uh, know that I felt. And uh, like, so you convinced me that Dostoevsky is an excellent businessman. And so, for example, like there's that point where he's first introducing Zasima and he introduces him through Yusuf's eyes. And when we look at that in class, we usually like, in, you know, with students would say, well, this is polyphony, right? That he loves Zasima, but he's showing us through the eyes of somebody who hates Zasima in order to give us the choice whether or not we want to take on this character that Dostoevsky obviously loves. But the, but the, probably the clearer answer to that is to, that he's a very good businessman and that he knows that his readership is secular. And so if he starts praising Zasima, everybody's going to stop reading. So, but, and, and so this leads to the question of Dostoevsky being a great businessman. What then is the value of taking wildly unpopular positions? And I think that this, like, so for example, he knows that his readership is secular. He knows that his readership are like materialists, rationalists, positivists, socialists. This is a progressive, educated leadership. And every novel he fights against those positions, making, making the bulk of his readers uncomfortable. And, and what's interesting is that like, so the reason I ask is because like it's at odds with the contemporary business model behind art, like mainstream art today, right? So if you like look at like the Netflix model, they know through their algorithms what we like because they, they know what we watch. And so they generate new material that's like that. And there's something very gross about it that you're watching something because you watch something else that's like that. So they just make something else like the thing. Like it's like, so you, you have is an erosion of, like the artist is not presenting something that challenges you. The artist is saying, you like this, I'll give you more of this, eat your little candy. And so something happens like on YouTube, for example, that you like this video, you must like these videos. You're not being challenged, which is horrible because you like something, then you get stuck in this little bubble where you only get fed that kind of thing. And so I guess my question is, if Dostoevsky is a good businessman, and he's presenting wildly unpopular positions in all of his novels to his readership. Is there a value to ideological dissonance? And what would Dostoevsky be able to teach the Netflix executives like today if he was being a consultant with his great business sense? Um, and this comes back, I think, absolutely to, to my central argument about um, the nature of the, um, the, the, the readership. Uh, because you know who was who was was Dostoevsky writing for? To me, he's he's a, a, a writer who is acutely sensitive to the fact that the the people who he is currently writing for are not necessarily the end of the story, um, it, it, and and it, no matter how limited and um, opinionated his current audience uh, might be, an audience in ten years or or twenty years or thirty years time um, might be completely different, and this is why I, I keep keep coming back to the contrast with France and, and, and how aware the Russian writers seem to have been of developments in France and how they were looking over um, the, the, the wall, peering at an audience which was beyond the, the, their ability to generate in Russia at the time, but which clearly existed, uh, both in England and in France and to, to an extent in Germany. Um, uh, you know, it was evident that there would be a much bigger audience out there. And if you are a writer um, like Dostoevsky, who I think is quite conscious of his place in the literary canon or the place he would like to adopt, his correspondence certainly reveals um, that, that you know, he's, he's writing about the big topics of his day because he thinks that they will last and they will be of continuing uh, interest to, to future generations. Um, it, it, so if you're doing that then you in a sense you you have you, your horizon is not bounded by the audience you currently see um it uh and it makes a lot of sense to go beyond that um and to to uh, uh throw out positions which may well be inimical to your audience uh, of today although you know being a bit challenging is no is, is never uh, necessarily a bad thing. Look at President Trump, for example, um, and um, and th to, to to include positions which you think may be relevant tomorrow rather than today. And I think he does this 
on a systematic basis. I, I don't think this is a, an accident. I don't think it's um, something which is is um, uh, you know, unconscious. I think it's very, very much a play for uh, you know, how do I get myself into a, a position where uh, the, the, as large as possible, uh, an audience has something to respond to in me. And I think, you know, you, if you look at the kind of reception that this is, it gets today, it's, it's evident that whether by accident or by design, he's been very successful at it. I mean, you know, a good big businessman, possibly by accident. Right. So it's not about clicks. It's also about building a library that a hundred years from now would still have value. And the yes, and, and 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 there, I think it it, it differs to an extent from the um, advice that you give to Netflix today, because I think they're building a, a library for the next three months to maybe three years. Um, they're not, you know, they're they're not addressing the posterity audience. Very little of what they create today will be will be viewed, if anything, in fifty years' time. Um, I. I I don't think uh, um, that, that Dostoevsky was thinking in those terms at all. And you only have to go back. I mean, this is, a, 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 I think, a theme which was in people's minds. Um, you think of Stendhal, for example, in France, writing, quote, for the happy few, uh, a, a, an epigram he, epigram he, he used on, on several of his, his works, um, which is generally taken to, to mean the, the, the kind of readers who would come in the future um, you know, in sort of 50, 100 years, 100 years time, I think there is a consciousness here that, that the audience, the recipients were changing at a rate of knots um, uh, and that you, d you had no idea uh, who was, how, how the, um, the, the, the recipients of your narratives in 10 years time or 20 years time were going to, going to take it. And you had to write kind of with them in the, in the back of your mind. Thank you very much. Uh, we um, are bound uh, by the clock here and have only two or three minutes left. Uh, and I think this would be an appropriate time once again to thank Jonathan for a wonderful talk, which I have to say these ideas you have, the uh, concepts, the methodology you've developed over the last decade really uh, improve with age. Uh, <laughs> a great bottle of claret. Um, they, were, they were always good, but uh, the more I think about them, the more sense they make. Uh, and that speaks well for the prosperity value of what you're doing. Uh, thank you so much for sharing these with us. Uh, and uh, the best place to see them expanded is in the book, uh, which was published by the Harvard University Press. Um, and uh, looking forward to your next return. Uh, we thank you for this one and uh, say goodbye. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for the welcome, Justin. Thank you, Kate, if you're still on. Uh, thank you for the uh, Dostoevsky Society um, sponsorship. Uh, Robin and Yuri, lovely to see you again on, on, on the <coughs> slide here. Well, we'll have, a, have a wave. It would be very nice to go out, go out to dinner again afterwards, but um, we're going to have to wait for that one. Thank you very much indeed. And um, let's leave it there. Okay. Goodbye. Bye.